All right, Tidy Biology fans, you made it. Welcome to class five. Today is gonna to be the final formal lecture where we will cover data reproducibility, the package R Markdown, and Knitter, which is going to teach us how to knit documents, meaning we are going to put them all together to create formal reports. This is the last formal lecture because class six is reserved for the student presentations. You can go ahead at the end of this class and pop over to class six and see some of the work that the students did. But otherwise, hang on, because we're about to wrap up the Tidy Biology lecture series. Let's go. This, is, this will be the last uh, lecture where we're going to be um, uh, doing some code alongs and walking through the, uh, the exercise together. Today's Friday, that means you have the weekend to try to put together your, again, emphasize, uh, two to three minute presentation for the final class on Monday, uh, in which we will um, not have any lectures, we will only have uh, the presentations. So um, I will take the last few minutes of class today to go over the presentation, what it might look like, give you an example. Uh, but today we'll uh, talk about scientific uh, reproducibility and provenance with our markdown. So this is going to be a dive into the R Markdown document and why we have decided to teach you R Markdown in these R Markdown documents rather than just standalone R scripts for your projects. Before we get going today, do you guys have any questions about anything? About what we talked about on Wednesday? Okay, so... Uh, slides are um, in the usual spot, and we'll have an exercise to go through. Um, but essentially, some of this should be review. This is great. If this is review, then that means you learned it the first time that we told you about it. Um, if it's not, great. It's an opportunity for you guys to learn it today. So uh, to, to review or to um, dive into the R Markdown. So remember, this is a plain text file, but then it has um, uh, three different types of content within it. Okay. So the first, this is called the YAML header. So uh, YAML is a yet another markup language or something like this. Um, so this is a header that contains a special type of code. It's surrounded by three dashes in each place. And this then is going to be um, where you are going to tell our markdown some special things about the document that it is about to see. The next is going to be text in the markdown. And this is really the benefit of um, having this type of document as opposed to just an R script, is because you can intersperse text um, and your code. The third type, of course, is code, and these are code chunks surrounded by three back ticks, this uh, tick, tick, tick. And so you've got some text here, it's written in markdown, then you've got some code, you've got an output, you've got a little bit more text, and so on. And so we really have this now uh, literate and obvious walkthrough of your code and what you were thinking. I mentioned previously, each time that you write code, you want to comment your code to remind a future version of yourself what you were thinking when you did this. You can also do that here. So I oftentimes use the text section above a code chunk to introduce what I'm doing, to, to uh, lay out the thing I'm trying to accomplish. If I'm getting some data from a website, I often say, this is the source of the data, this is where I got it from. You know, sometimes you have to put in some parameters before you download a file from the website. I'll put those parameters in there. And so this really then sets it up and then the code and some notes about the code and, and so on. All right, so this is intuitive or this is obvious. We've seen this several times before. We're gonna go through each of these different, that we'll go through the YAML header, we'll go through the text and the markdown, and we'll go through the code chunks, um, really to uh, see how these behave when we tell uh, our markdown, which is a package, to then go through, and we call this knit. It will knit this together in order to make a PDF report of your entire output. So that's where we're going. That's what it's going to look like. All right. So how it works. We first start with us, our markdown document. And this is exactly the thing that I just showed you. We use this package called knitter, and then knitter is going to convert our markdown into a standard markdown document. So Markdown is a, another language. It has uh, syntax, and it has a, a certain way of behaving. And that Markdown document then can be converted to several different types of documents. You can knit this to a PDF. You can knit this to HTML, a PowerPoint. You saw Akshay used 
uh, this uh, IO slides, right, for uh, generating his slides. So all of his slides, because he's super fancy, uh, were our markdown documents that then he knitted into a markdown and subsequently into slides. Well, of course, there are packages that basically string all of these together. So he just wrote this R markdown slides, and then he knitted these to the slides in the end. All right, so knit runs the document in a fresh R session, which means that you need to load libraries that the document uses in the document. So this is important because you can often have you know, multiple uh, R Markdown documents open. And if you load a library, which we do one time each session, then that will be loaded and you'll be doing some work. And maybe you've got then your, your final project document open right next to it. And this is a different R Markdown document. And then you're kind of going back and forth between the two. Maybe you've got like a, a, a playground or sandbox in one, and this is going to be my final and the other. Well, if you don't load the libraries in each of these, then the, uh, the, the one that doesn't have the library will throw an error. So when you knit, it knits it fresh each time, and it runs through as if it's never seen it. So this is great because for provenance and reproducibility, we want to be able to take a very fresh document and knit it. If, if one of your classmates says, here's my final project, what do you think of it? You should be able to hit run all, or in this case, knit, and it will run through the whole thing without throwing any errors. So keep that in mind. It's going to do it fresh right from the beginning. The other thing is a little bit like run all. When you knit a document through this R markdown, the objects made in one code chunk will be available in code chunk later uh, in, in later code chunks. All right. So this works just like run all. We load our libraries. We create an object. This object is called super interesting data frame. And then later on, we use ggplot and we call super interesting data frame. The same thing is going to happen in Knitter. So it's going to, again, fresh session. It's going to load your libraries. And then it will run through your code. It will make each uh, element of your code chunks, each object, fresh each time. And then it will continue along the code. <coughs> Now, just like all things are, there's an online free uh, document that will, it's a book actually, um, about all things R Markdown that you can use as a reference that you can find um, at, this, uh, at this website here that will go much, much deeper into class. Because recall, we have five classes together. This is class number five. We are just about at the end of our time of the things that I will be able to teach you. But one thing that I want to provide for you are resources that allow you to continue on this, this path along this trajectory beyond class. So if you're really interested in how can I make these reports that are going to be a summary of my data, of my, uh, of my projects, this would be a great resource for you to see. OK, so let's look at the markdown. So we've got text, and text is written in markdown. So this R Markdown document is essentially a, uh, a uh, underneath it is essentially a Markdown document. And Markdown is a language that goes far beyond R. And so what I want to do now is, is take a moment and uh, teach you about some of the syntax that Markdown uses so that you can use this in your R Markdown documents. And when you knit your PDFs or your HTML files, they will look beautiful. Okay? So um, a quick question before we dive in. How many of you have made a website before? Raise your hands. Maybe one, uncertainly. Maybe, OK. So um, then um, a lot of the syntax of the markdown is similar, which is why I ask. So when you guys are making, OK, let's, let's try another exercise. How many of you have made a PowerPoint presentation before? All right, everybody. OK, now we're speaking the same language. So in your PowerPoint presentation, oftentimes you will have a, a title of the slide. And that will then be in some large title text. And then you've got your, um, your list of results. And you are going to then have number one. And then you might have like a sub bullet. And then you're going to have item number two and a sub bullet and so on. So this is a hierarchical way of listing out 
Um, uh, in this case, it's called an ordered list. Um, so we've got titles and we've got some hierarchy below it. Well, the first element of our markdown that I want to show you about are called headers. So you can change the font and change the size of your, uh, of your text in our markdown simply by putting a pound sign, a space, and then what you want to uh, write out. So if you open up um, a, a blank R Markdown document, um, if you'd like to follow along and just try some of these as we go through them, you're more than welcome to. So um, in Microsoft Word, you'll oftentimes select, uh, highlight the word uh, of, that you want to change the format of, and then you'll go up to the menu bar, and you will then you know, click B for bold, and you will click up, 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 up for making this bigger or change the size, right? That all is familiar and intuitive. Same thing in PowerPoint. Now, the problem with that is it's not reproducible. If I wanted to make the exact same uh, formatting uh, to a document, I would have to know exactly what you did. Right? So we're going to now put in code that changes text in very specific ways that will be reproducible across all of the students. So the first is called header. So when you're making a report, you can then put a header title and say, this, is, um, uh, uh, this, this code chunk is going to be, let's say, called uh, import data. So we can then have a header that's called import data. We say, number sign, space, import data. And then if you had a hard return to the next line, you start typing text, you will have a header. Now it turns out if you just do one uh, number sign, one pound sign, this is incredibly obnoxiously large text. So, Use at your discretion, right? I think in some of mine, the biggest I put was like three. But again, we all have different taste and style, so it's up to you. So these are headers. This is how you're going to change the header of the section that you're about to write about. Okay, this is text. So text is rendered in plain text. Um, and you can surround it with formatting marks to format it. So text is text. If you want to do italics, it's an underscore, the word, and put an underscore straight after it. So this will start to look a little bit unusual because you'll have normal a normal paragraph of let's say text, but then it's going to start having all of these um, uh, asterisk asterisk uh, word and two more, and like it, it will look un, unfamiliar and unusual and hard to read sort of the raw code. But when you knit this, it will add italics or bold uh, to any of these. You guys know about this this uh, mark this code. So this is the back tick. So we did this on the very first day in Slack. Maybe it was the second day. So it turns out Slack uses Markdown, sort of, because Slack will use italics. Slack will use bold. It doesn't use this for bold. I don't think it actually uses this for italics. So, um, so they have sort of pseudo Markdown, and the Markdown world is you know, moaning and complaining that Slack missed an opportunity to, to instill Markdown into thousands or millions of users. Um, but, uh, but you can see that several of these um, um, sort of formats will look familiar uh, because we've used some of them in, in our markdown. So you've got normal text, and then text is going to be converted into a special kind of text when we knit this together. Now, an important point. If you add two spaces to the end of a line, that will start a new line. So if you just take, like, um, you hit enter, and you start another text um, a block, <coughs> enter isn't recognized by our markdown. You need to, you need to um, hit space, space, and then enter. And that space space will start a new line. If you want to have a paragraph, you would need to go space space enter, space space enter, and that will skip two lines. Okay? So again, we need to start putting in some of this, this R markdown uh, code, or this markdown code for uh, R markdown to knit and recognize. Lists. Okay, we can use asterisks to make bulleted. Uh, uh, lists, and this would be like an unordered list. If we want an ordered list, also called a numbered list, we can just say one period space and our item, and this will automatically indent these numbered or bulleted lists. So pretty straightforward stuff now. All you need to do is you need to recognize what the language is. Okay, hyperlinks. This is a link. The link could be to a repository. It could be to a data source or something. The way that you write that is you first put the word that you want linked in a um, square bracket, and then the link to it is in a parentheses um, after it. There's no space in between these. 
This just doesn't fit on the same line. This will drop down if it gets too long. But um, you've got a square bracket and parentheses right next to each other, the word that you want to link, and then what it links to. Images. So images um, can be uh, put into your R Markdown um, document. What you need to do is you need to put um, this uh, uh, exclamation point in a square bracket. And then what you can do is in the parentheses, a little bit looking like a hyperlink, this is going to be the path to the image. All right, so if you have, let's say, um, some, some image that's going to be really important to include in your R Markdown document or in your knitted report, but this image is not one that you generate from your code, then what you need to do is you need to download that, that image, you need to put it into the directory, your, your working directory, and then when you knit, it will look for that image um, in that directory. Okay, equations. Um, this is going to um, be a little bit beyond the scope of the class here, but there is another language that is called LaTeX. Raise your hand if you've heard of the programming language LaTeX, not the material that your sort of gloves are made of. Okay, so LaTeX is a, a text rendering engine that is going to be able to take some uh, code and turn it into uh, any kind of text, especially text that is uh, fancy equations. Okay, so what you're seeing here is you can write equations with LaTeX math commands Surround them by these money signs, and then it will know to take this and convert it into, um, into the, the properly formatted equation. So LaTeX is this whole other language. I just want to mention that it's out there. Um, you will see uh, different uh, GitHub pages, um, or you'll see different stack overflow uh, answer pages uh, refer to it. Um, all you need to know is that it is a, another language that is oftentimes um, basically, it predates Word, it predates um, all of the um, sort of uh, standard tools that we have, um, but it is a way to, um, to uh, convert text into especially scientific notation. Okay, so um, just another, I guess, uh, a point to, to remember. You can put two of these here, this will center it. All right, so this is, um, again, just trying to give you guys some tools that I think that you might use um, in some of your um, in some of your reports. All right. Now, um, of course, just like the um, the other uh, libraries, our Markdown um, is a library and it has a cheat sheet. So what you can do is you can look at the um, the R Markdown cheat sheet. There's a front and a back or two pages. Um, if you open it through R Studio Cloud, what you can see is that this section. Um, has a dictionary of uh, formatting cues. So you can see then, if you want to make it look like the thing on this side, this is the code here on the left side. So I'll, I'll remind you and I'll share with you again that when I'm working on um, our, our projects in our studio, and when I am trying to figure out how to do something, I am looking at cheat sheets, I am on Google, I'm on Stack Overflow, I am you know, uh, going to Ali to ask, you know, what would you do? Like, th there's the, uh, an incredible infrastructure of resources available to you to figure out how to do these things. So the good thing is, there's no test, there's no exam. I will not ask you if uh, bold has one or two asterisks on either side of the word, right? But what I want you to know is where resources are to find those things, all right? And the more that you do this, the more you will learn, the more intuitive it will become, the less that you will have to go um, uh, look at the cheat sheet to figure out how to do something, unless, of course, that is removing the legend from a ggplot graph, like I still have to do every single time. Okay. So, again, you guys know through the help file, um, or the help menu in the RStudio um, or RStudio Cloud, you can see that there's cheat sheets, and um, here's this one. There's a R Markdown click reference, um, and I think in the cheat sheets you should also see it. If you also just Google R Markdown Cheat Sheet, you'll probably land on the GitHub repository that holds the cheat sheet. So um, what I've done is I actually downloaded the cheat sheets into a folder on my computer so that you know, when I don't have internet access or I know exactly um, what I need to find, um, I have that resource. Now the cheat sheets are updated from time to time. So if you do download a local instance, 
just realize that they, uh, being the people who make the cheat sheets, um, update them from time to time. Okay, now, code. Code chunks, are, uh, any questions before we um, uh, move from our text, uh, our markdown text to code? All right, code. These are code chunks. Surrounded by these, um, these backticks, three backticks. So this is next to the number one, um, usually shared with a tilde on your keyboard. Now, hopefully, you've inserted the code chunk using the shortcuts. You can just manually type out slash, 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 curly bracket, R, curly bracket, some code, and so on. Um, when you render the report, R Markdown uses this code and includes its results. R Markdown will also remove the code that tells it that it's code. So it won't include that. Um, that's, that's good um, because really what it is, again, it's just a sign for our markdown to handle um, uh, this section in a specific way. So it runs the code and it removes that and it puts this in a, um, in a, in a code chunk. And you guys for Mac or for, uh, for, PC, or for PC, hopefully are remembering that this is uh, command uh, option I or control alt I to manually uh, quickly insert a code chunk into your R Markdown document. But we also have some code options, okay? These, these, these chunk options of how to display the code. Now, by default, when you knit your report, you've got a code chunk, and it will both include the code chunk and include the results. So you can see here, we've got, here's some code, that's in text, it's outside of the code chunk, so it's just shown as text, right? And then we've got a code chunk, and it shows us the code, right? It took out the slash hash slash curly Q R, but it highlights this in gray to indicate this is a code chunk. And then what it does is dim is a function that is going to tell you the dimensions of your data frame. So this is a data set, and we've got uh, 150, by five. So it's 150 rows and it's five columns. That's the dimensions. So now we've got our code and we've got the output. This pound pound just tells you that this is the output. Now, what if you want to change this? What if you want to just show the output? Like sometimes, you know, you would want to have a ggplot and you don't need all the code for a ggplot, but you want to put your beautiful picture that you just made there. Or maybe you don't want to run the code at all. Right, because um, this is uh, just for an example. Or you want to run the code, but you don't want to show it. Like for example, like your setup chunk. You know, if you get some warnings or some messages in your, in your setup chunk, like you load a library, and you guys have probably seen, sometimes when you run that setup chunk that has a library in it, you'll see you know, warning, warning, warning. And oftentimes these warnings are deplier um, uh, is sharing the name of a function with something in base R. So um, the, the warning will say something about it being masked. So mask just means that you can't use that function by just saying select, for example. Um, you can still use it in deplier, you just need to tell it it's from deplier. But anyhow, you've got all these warnings, right? And so you don't want, maybe you want to run that chunk, but you don't want to show any of the output or show any of the warnings. So you've got now chunk options. By default, the option is to run the code, show the code, show the results. All right, but if we want to um, uh, change how this behaves, one of the things we can include is echo equals false. So here's some code on the left. The output is on the right. What does echo equals false do? Louder. Hides the code. Yes. Does it run the code? Yes. And does it show the output? Yeah. Exactly. So, in this case, we're going to hide that code chunk that we saw here. But what we're going to do is we're still going to run the code and show the output. So echo equals false is included within those curly brackets. And remember I said sometimes this would be useful this sort of concept would be useful for a graph or a plot. So this is exactly where you might use this. You can run the code. Um, you can uh, generate an output. You can show that output. So there's a space here. 
and then echo equals false within the curly bracket. Now, evaluate. Evaluate equals false. What's different about this one? What does evaluate equals false do? By default, these are all true. So if you manually put them to false, it will override that true. So what does evaluate do? It doesn't show the output. Why does it not show the output? Right? But uh, another question. Did it run this code? No, it didn't. And that's where the intuition of evaluate comes from. Should I evaluate this code chunk? The answer is no. So it doesn't even, it's, it's not like it ran it and then is hiding it. Kind of like in the last example here, you know, we, um, we, we you know, ran this, we evaluated it, but we're just hiding you know, one of these code chunks. In this case, we're not hiding the output. We're just not running this. So if we don't run it, if we don't evaluate it, there is no output. Okay. So this can be useful sometimes if you want to show a code chunk. You want to show what the code would do, but maybe there's like something that's overly complicated or you want to um, make some simple training examples or, or something. You can um, have a code that you evaluate that you don't show the output and then a code chunk that you don't evaluate and you show it or something. I think Ali has done this. We're going to talk about the uh, vignette um, project at the end of the day today and go through some of these. And you'll see some of these examples of uh, at least a couple of possible ways you can uh, use them. OK, include. Include equals false, runs the code, but prevents both the code and the results from appearing, for example, to the setup chunk. All right, so now we look here. Here's some code, here's some code, and nothing is on the right. So this would be the same as evaluate equals true, right, because we're evaluating this. But we don't want to um, show the um, output. So this would be like echo equals false. But we also don't want to show the code chunk, right? So the way we wrap all of that together would be just to say, do we include this or not? So we run it, yes. So value is true, but include in this case would be false. So some of these are intuitive, right? Evaluate, include, we can start to think about this. Some of them are less so. Other things that we can include. Yes, question. I, um, from the previous slide. Does it matter if within the bracket, curly brackets, if there was a space in between the equal sign and including false? No. I like putting the spaces. I like letting my code breathe a little bit. Yeah. All right. So here, you can also specify the dimensions of plots. So for example, here's a plot. Echo equals false. What is echo equals false going to do? It doesn't show the code, right? So here's a plot. And then you can also specify if you want to set the dimensions of a plot, for example. And then this is just code saying histogram, iris, you know, uh, one, one feature of it. And, uh, and, and we see that over here. So if you have um, uh, something that you want to, let's say you're going to include multiple plots and they all want to be the same, you could set that here. So it's an easy way to, to override some of the default options, let's say, that, that R or ggplot are going to provide. And um, you, can, you can tell our markdown um, how to uh, uh, knit this picture into your, your output. All right. Now, you can also, this is sort of a blend now of how text behaves and how a code chunk behaves. So we said text is text. And what we do is we... Um, we have the markdown formatting for that text. And code chunks are code chunks. And we put those ticks and the curly brackets and everything, and our markdown knows how to behave. It evaluates it. If we tell it to, it shows the output and so on. But what if you want to be writing a report or writing something, and you want to call a, uh, uh, some code, like a function, and say, 
you know, the mean of my data set is, wouldn't it be really nice if we could just say mean, instead of like writing it out, like 12.7, if we just had a command that said mean my variable and then keep writing our text. The way that we do that is this is in a text now. So the way that we do that is we have one backtick, r space, some function, some code, and then another backtick. So you surround your function by backticks, but you need to tell r, or you need to tell markdown that this is an r function so it knows where to look. And um, you guys saw this in class one. What does sys.date do? Provides a system date. Exactly. So here, today is blank. So now we have today is the date. And the formatting is going to be the default formatting. If you want to change the formatting, good luck. No, just kidding. There are ways to do that. It will require some different packages. But um, in this case, um, we'll, just, we'll just keep it like that. Okay. So what would happen if you wrote this inside of, an, uh, inside of a code chunk? Yeah, what if you just made a code chunk and it looked like this and you've got your back tick, back tick, back tick, R, or curly, R, curly, and then you just wrote this in there. What would happen? Go ahead, try it if you want. But go ahead, guess. Yeah, exactly. It would throw an error. It would say today it can't find. It would look for today as an object. It would look for is as an object. I don't even know what it would look like, it would, what it would do for this, but it would probably error ever before it got to sys date. Okay? Because again, a code chunk, it says this is code. So it says I'm looking for certain things inside of that code. All right. So this is what it would look like to insert some results of a function. So surround it with backtick r, the code, and this is the code to run. And only the result is going to be in included here. All right. This is um, this is helpful. I like this one because what I've done lately is, uh, Ali could tell you, um, I've started generating some reports about genes. Okay, you guys will do that today too. And what I want to do is I want to instead of manually write my favorite gene is, and then my favorite gene it turns out is MDH. It's a um, makes an enzyme called malate dehydrogenase. You guys will have to come up with a favorite gene today, so start thinking about it if you don't have one. So my favorite gene is malate dehydrogenase because we share initials together. Okay, so you soon will have to come up with your favorite gene. So this is a warning, start thinking. But instead of saying Matt's favorite gene is MDH, I could say Matt's favorite gene is Bactic R space fave gene, that's my object, Bactic. Now, if somewhere else in a code chunk, I assigned fave gene, the object, to be MDH, then it would automatically populate that. That's what you'll see today. So let's try that. Open up 05 exercise, I think it's called. Um, and uh, a couple of things. So I will do this with you. So in 5... Markdown, let's see, exercise report. So a couple of things. So notice a long setup chunk. Towards the bottom, you'll see some code that stores objects that you need to call. So I want you to admit the document and see the results. And I want you to then think about, I'll ask you towards the end, why the setup chunk is omitted from the report. But then the exercise and the activity then here is going to replace every bold that you see in that uh, R Markdown document with inline code. And then I want you to remove the student's chunk so it's not included in the output. And then finally, change the graph chunk so only the plot is shown and remit the document. So I will leave these instructions up. We will take about five minutes or so to step through. So open up that document and spend some time with it right now. Take a look at it. 
take a look at the code, go ahead and run it. You can knit it right now too if you want. Remember, knit is going to then be this fresh instance of converting that into another document. After you knit it, you should be able to see some objects that are made. So to really understand this, you have to look at the code. If any of the report is good, go ahead and knit it and look and see what it shows. But you really, you're going to need to look at the code to figure out what the code is doing. And remember, there are two ways to, well, probably several ways to knit a report, but the easiest is here, okay? So you can click knit and it will knit. And this one I need to install a package, it looks like. So I'll just do that first. I think I installed this package for you guys. But if you just click on that, that blue knit icon, it will knit the report for you. We'll talk about that little drop down arrow next to knit with our next exercise. Do they do the underscore for italics? All right, let's try this again. Knit, 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 because it's our Studio Cloud. Let's unblock the pop up blocker. And here we go. Raise your hand if you're done with the exercise. Okay, keep going. As soon as you are finished, you will see one other markdown document in the classified folder. It should be called 05 Exercise Answers. So if you want to check your work, and by check your work, really it's replacing every bold at the bottom with inline code. I provide that for you there. Back to the code. Oh, so. 
I ended up actually. They have to, I use the protein state frame for that. Okay. So, so tough? Yeah. So should I? Have, um, yeah, because I changed, because right, this was after do we use the, the things. Yeah, so I ended up doing something like this. All right, one question that everybody is um, about to have, right, is about this protein length business. I changed the data frame like the day before class and didn't update this exercise, okay? So don't worry about length right now. And in fact, what you could do is you could say, um, so instead of that data frame having a length variable, it has a score variable. So your new homework is going to be, or the new exercise is going to be, instead of saying, my um, favorite protein is this number of amino acids long, just change it to, out of one to five, you know, my protein in this location scored A, and then you can call the score, okay? So try that instead of saying how long my protein is, because I took the length information out of this subcell data frame right at the end. So I'll work on that with you guys up here. So if I run this, great, and then I run this, I've got some variables. Now I look at fave, I've got an ID, I've got a gene name, I've got a location, I've got a score. So these are some now um, uh, objects that I can call down here. I uh, didn't want to do that. Didn't want to do that. So it might look something like this towards the end, the code being at the top. So take another minute or two, maybe just one, and try to finish up point number five and point number six, remove the student's chunk so it's not included in the output, and change the graph chunk so that only the output of the plot is shown but not the code. Well, 
let's think about it for a minute. So we need to run it, right? Otherwise, when we knit, we won't have the objects we need. So we need it to run, but let's try removing that chunk so that chunk is not included in the output. So there is one code chunk option that indicated whether we include that code chunk or not. And then the last, number six, there was one code chunk option that indicated whether or not we should include the code or just the output. One of them that was useful just for including the output. Anybody else need more time? Okay, we'll continue with YAML, these YAML headers. Remember that YAML header is going to be all the way at the top okay, of our document. This is going to be surrounded by dash, dash, dash. So the YAML header is going to be a section that contains what we call key value pairs separated by dash lines. So the key value pair just means the key is a special type of code that YAML is looking for, and the pair is going to be the output. So if we had something like this, the YAML header, title is untitled, author is our studio, date is the date today, and here is our output. In this case, we're going to make an HTML document, so a web document. And when we ask our markdown to knit this, it will take this information, and it will automatically format it and convert it into a header part of our document that looks something like that. And the text goes down below, and if you want, you can put another header here, and we can look at our, our Markdown cheat sheet in order to figure out exactly what we want everything else to look like. But this YAML contains special information. Not surprising, the output field sets the format for our document, because remember, our Markdown gets knit to a Markdown document, and then that Markdown document gets converted into really any, not anything, but any of these types of uh, common output options. PDF, I haven't done Word yet. I usually do PDF, sometimes HTML. If you, um, uh, here's a pro tip. If you have HTML as an output, what will happen is uh, when you save or when you knit your R Markdown document, it will save an HTML preview of that R Markdown document. And this is convenient on uh, Macs because Mac doesn't know how to quick look or, or index or search in our Markdown document, but it does know how to do it for a safe PDF. So if I want to see like some code quickly inside of a R Markdown document, there's no such thing as quickly, unless its output is at least contains HTML, and then you can quick look the HTML, not the uh, uh, R Markdown document. Um, I also have, uh, most of the time, I send it to a PDF document, though. All right, so um, several different types of output values. Um, we can go ahead and play with those. When I get as fancy as Akshay, I will um, uh, convert these slides to, um, to our markdown. Um, but the, the most sort of useful element of this YAML header are called parameters. So let's take a couple of minutes. This should be short. Open up the parameters exercise and use the drop down menu to knit. And that knit should have an option that says knit with parameters and render the document. So go ahead and do that. I want you to explore this before we go into exactly what is happening. So open that document. And next to that little blue knit button, there should be an arrow. And that arrow then should say knit with parameters. And you've got a favorite gene. And you can put in your favorite gene and knit it. So click the button to knit the report. So just go knit with them. Just 
Yeah, frames. Yeah. And the same net with frames. And then just say net. Uh, I'm putting in these ones. So that's our base. Now, go ahead and um, close that and just put in the G. Put in G. So go ahead, try it a couple of times. Ask your neighbor what their favorite gene is. Yeah, so one of the parameter types is G. We'll go to that just once. So you can change it there and just click it. It will uh, knit with that parameter. Or if you didn't do the drop down, then you can type in the same knit with parameters. So, yeah, that's why we can change it. Oh, you can change it. Yeah, that's a lot, yeah. Okay, I didn't understand that. Yep, that's Okay, so let's walk through exactly what's happening now. So parameters. Parameters are a list of values that you could call in R code chunks. So here's a parameter list, elements and values. So params, it's looking for um, what parameters there are. And here we have to again do this sort of value key pair. So in this case, we've got a file name or we've got a symbol. I give you guys an example of favorite gene. So what ends up happening is, so here's the formatting. Params, colon, and then you can do like a, a space or in this case hard return. Again, I like to let my code breathe. So we've got some parameter file name, and then we've got like the file name or some parameter symbol. Um, we, we also, um, you can see in the code, um, the parameter is going to be, uh, actually, what is it? What does the parameter say in the, uh, that, that I called in that um, code? I think it's called gene, right? So gene, and then gene has a value. And the value should be in parentheses, right? I'm sorry, in uh, quotes. And so what does that mean? String. It's a string, exactly. So if this wasn't, this would be like an object, right? And so uh, you can get a little recursive and start calling objects and you know these sorts of things, but let's just keep it strings for now, okay? So um, so we've got, this is the, the formatting. New line, indented two spaces. Ah, right, because if we want to have a hard return, we need to um, put two spaces on the end. So space, space, next one, space, space, so on. Okay, now using parameters, so if we call a parameter um, in our code chunk, what we do is we say, okay, params, number, numbers 42. In this case, that's a numeric, right? It doesn't have any uh, quotes around it. So the value of the parameter is the formatting here should look familiar. We just did this with our inline R code chunks. We can call an object of our um, uh, that we generated by single backtick R, then our, our data frame and our value or our object. In this case, we treat it just the same. This is another object. It is a number that is within a parameter, and then it's going to give your output. So the value of the parameter is 42. So that's what it looks like. Okay, and if we had a different number here, it would be something different. So params and then the the, um, the key of params is how you call the value of that parameter. So params, so now if you look at the code that you knit, I didn't really ask you to do this the first time when I said just knit that code. If you look at that code, it's just a bunch of text. But if you look at the YAML header of that R markdown document, 
you should see params, colon, next line, gene, colon, and then a gene in quotation marks. And then if you look at the text below that YAML header or after that YAML header ends, what you will see is that my favorite gene is backtick, r, space, params, money sign, gene. All right? So if you set your gene in the parameter and you knit that and you just click knit, it will knit the whole thing. When you clicked on the arrow next to that knit button and you get that drop down, and the option was knit with parameters, you can change those parameters on the fly. So go ahead, try those two things now. If you didn't change, if you didn't hard code that parameter into your uh, YAML header, go ahead and do that. Just replace MDH1 with your favorite gene. And then just click knit. You don't need to say knit with parameters. By default, it will knit with that parameter in place. So if you do that, you should get a knitted uh, output that has now instead of my favorite gene, your favorite gene in there. And after you do that, the, uh, the third thing you could try is after you hard code that in, you still have the option to change it on the fly. So if you hit the drop down next to knit and you say knit with parameters, a menu will pop up with the single parameter. If you had more than one, you would have two boxes there. But you have a single parameter, and the parameter is gene, so you can type in another gene. So uh, lean over to your neighbor, ask what his or her favorite gene is. Do this now. And go ahead and take their favorite gene and put it into your knit with parameters dialog box. Yes. Um, I'll tell you about it after. So um, what ends up happening is um, I figured that out. The problem is to, to close that out. So uh, in subcell, you are pulling out. Uh, you have, uh, in that version of subcell, uh -huh. I guess, you have more than one MDH in there because MDH is associated with several different subcell locations. Okay. So what I did for the subcell subsequently was to um, take the top subcell value. Mm -hmm. So it will be more of a little bit of a more of a solid It says top end, top subcell count. All right, so, so this generally is called, this generally is called parameterizing your document. All right, so you can set parameters here um, and uh, include them. So re-inspect um, this parameters exercise, and you can see how many times um, the parameter was called in the code. So go ahead, look at that code right now, and count. We'll take a vote in just a moment. So open up this document and see how many times was parameter called in the code. So look at the entire R Markdown document and look and see. All right, let's vote. Let's start with one. Who counted one instance? Two. Three. Four. The answer is three. Where's the third one? It's not a trick question. Just have to look harder. It's in the YAML header. Where are the other two? <laughs> 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 and there's one. There's two in that header. One in the header. Is one here. There. One here. Wait, there was one where? All right, so Pram, oh, sorry, Pram's gene is here. And then... Two, and then favorite. Let's 
go like this. I thought it was three. One, two, two. Two is the correct answer. <laughs> All right, good. It was a trick question. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, so um, we are. I'm gonna. I'm gonna mention this to you. Okay. Um, so we've got 15 minutes of class, and there's a couple more things that I want to go over. All right, so um, your homework today, which I'm going to ask, we'll have a few minutes to do in class today, but just go ahead and open it right now and take a look at it. So open 05 underscore homework, and your homework today is going to be summarize each of the data sets within the tidy biology package. So I provide code for you to view the packages, and I provide the first code chunk that summarizes, uh, sorry, not packages. Within the tidy biology package, you will see the data sets. I want you to summarize the data sets within the tidy biology package. I've summarized the first data set for you. I think I summarized chromosome. You've seen this before. I just took a glimpse at chromosome. I want you to do this for the rest of the data sets within the package. Now, you might say, well, that's kind of uh, redundant. The reason is because we are now standing at the edge of class, the end of class, our time together, and you will need to take one of these data sets and roll around in it, come up with some interesting analysis, and present it to us on Monday. So as a good starting point, viewing the data sets, understanding what's in them, seems like a good start. Okay. Now. You can do that. You can knit the final data set summary report um, just to practice knitting, looking at code chunks, etc. Now, But what I want to do um, in this last uh, couple of minutes on the timer, we'll just forget about the timer for a minute. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to um, navigate to the help file underscore vignette. In that directory, you'll find a file called pivot longer. I want you to knit that file, so just open it, knit it. I don't think there are any parameters in it, so you can just click knit. And then it's going to open a new window. Take a minute or two, just to reinforce some of these knitting ideas, to look at the code output and to look at the code paying special attention to the code chunk options to get a sense of what's included, what's not, how it looks. So this is a beautiful example of a knitted file generated by Ali that has both a reference to a figure, it has some formatting, it has some different um, uh, header sizes, and it also has a combination of include, evaluate, echo, etc. So just take a minute or two to look at that. So the question is in the in the um, pivot longer example, you see that there are three different outputs. HTML, PDF, and Word. So if you go up to knit now, and you click on the drop down arrow, you will see three different options. Knit to HTML, knit to PDF, knit to Word. Okay? If you just click on knit, um, it will knit to a HTML, because HTML is listed there first. And it evaluates everything in order. So just Ali was giving you options if you want to knit to a Word document or something else. So this is a function. This is a function in the deplier package. It's actually a brand new function. It's replacing a, 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 a previously named function that performs essentially the same type of data transformation. And this is Ali's help file vignette that she created as inspiration for your help file vignette. So if Ali's name had been included on the, uh, the help file vignette, Markdown or uh, a data frame that you guys generated, 
it would have said something like, how do I um, make my data longer? Or how do I prepare them for uh, graphing? Something like this. You can see the um, maybe Google searches that you would type in to land on this page. And there's a function that is now called pivot longer. And this is part of the, actually the part of the tidier package, I think. Is that right? And, um, and it walks through the type of data transformation that is required to prepare your data for plotting. So if you want to learn about how to prepare your data for plotting, you can go ahead and read this. Okay? But the reason to show you this now is twofold. One is because you now have a better understanding of how our markdown documents are knit to a final output that looks like what Ali generated. We've got text formatting, we've got code chunks, we've got a YAML header, we've got a few different things. So also in that help file vignette directory, you will see a template. That template is essentially a skeleton. You can use it if you'd like. Because one of the things that you will do on Monday is you will also um, have completed your own help file vignette for the function and the um, operation that you were completely randomly assigned. So um, you can take a look at that. And again, that, along with the uh, lecture notes from today, will be your guide for generating your own help file vignette. So that should be just sort of one side activity for you to do that will accomplish two things. It will help you really nail this uh, uh, code and commenting um, and um, options for um, our markdown and knitting. It will also then provide a resource for all of your classmates that you will then have beyond this class. Because Ali generated, how do I prepare my data for, for visualization and ggplot? And each of you will have a different uh, help file that we will then um, uh, collate and distribute to all of you for this class and beyond. All right. Any questions about the help file vignette? Yes, question. Um, so in Ali's example, she has an exclamation mark before her brackets for like linking the pivot long schematic. Is there a reason why there is an exclamation mark there? Yes. Because that is the, the question is why is there an exclamation point in front of the square bracket for linking the image to that spot? Because recall, a square back bracket with a parentheses alone is how you link to a URL. A exclamation point with a square bracket with a parentheses is how you link to a file. So that parentheses tells our markdown, I'm looking for a file rather than rendering text uh, with a hyperlink underneath it. Other questions? OK, now I want to give you a sense of what we are looking for uh, for your final presentation on Monday. So navigate to 06, final project directory. You can open up uh, variation PNG. Also open up Hershey RMD. You can take that Hershey RMD and go ahead and knit the file. If it has some packages that aren't installed, go ahead and click install them. Our studio makes that easy. I don't know if I install them for you guys or not. I have a couple of other packages here. While that's installing, you can go ahead and look at that, uh, that PNG. While this is installing, I'll also mention, in the help file vignette, there is a second vignette, which Akshay prepared. Remind me, Akshay, remind everybody what it is about. In a join. Uh, it's a join, right? So some of you have a join. Um, so Akshay helped you uh, quite a bit with that for inspiration. Um, I think, does somebody here have join? Xjoin was, uh, no? Euler? No? Yeah, that's it too. It's fine. Um, but anyhow, just as another example. 
All right, so if we run all, oh, actually, I didn't need to do that. I meant to knit. All right, so if we knit the document, we see something like this. Try again. Huzzah. Okay, so what we have here now is a, um, an example of a final report. I generated this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two minutes and present this as I would present it, um, as, as you would present your own uh, to class. All right, Akshay, you can time me. No, don't time me. <laughs> so, um, all right. Um, my name is Matt. I'm in the Hershey lab. And today I'm going to be telling you about analysis I did on the chromosome uh, data set. The chromosome data set has some uh, summary information about the human chromosomes um, uh, organized by chromosome number and then how long it is, the number of base pairs, variations, and um, other types of information. To start, I began by exploring the relationship between the number of protein coding genes and the number of base pairs. Perhaps not surprising, generally longer chromosomes have more protein coding genes, but that made me curious about variation. So to look at variation, I wanted to investigate the relationship between the number of base pairs and the amount of variation on each chromosome. And so a simple sort of linear relationship I see here that most of the time we see the amount of, uh, of uh, genomic variation in a chromosome is directly correlated or has a direct relationship with the amount of, or with the, um, the number of base pairs it has. But I noticed that there were two chromosomes that are clearly lower. So the X chromosome and the Y chromosome, these fall below the line. So they have less variation than would be expected based on their length. So next, I thought about how do I visualize this? Because really what I want to do is I want to visualize the distance from here to here and from here to here compared to everybody else that falls along this line. So I tried a couple of different ways. And I ended up choosing this um, lollipop plot, mostly because it's called a lollipop plot, but also because it allows me to show the difference from what I, what I showed here was the mean, the, the average genomic variation. So I calculated this, it's 4.9%, and I was able to put that line here, and I wanted to then show where the different chromosomes uh, fall for the percent variation. So I made this plot, sex chromosomes have lower genomic variation than the other chromosomes, and I assess the genomic variation on each cr uh, chromosome. So here I conclude that the amount of genomic variation is lowest on X and Y chromosomes compared to the remaining human chromosomes. This observation implies that the fidelity of the DNA sequences is more stringent, and perhaps unique mechanisms are in place to ensure this low variation. If I were then to take this observation and test it in the lab, some prioritized follow-up studies might be um, to look at the chromatin, because chromatin states are known to influence genomic variation. Therefore, I might look at chromatin states at some specific genomic loci, including histone modifications, DNA methylation status, chromatin compaction, et cetera. So, um, acknowledgments. I would like to acknowledge uh, Cedric Scherer for plot inspiration. He had a, a really nice walkthrough of how to make this plot. I hadn't made one before this class, and so I'll give a shout out to Cedric. And then also um, to, to Garrett and Hadley and the RStudio team for making um, uh, the Tiverse packages easy to use for people like me to figure out how to make plots like this and all of you for reaching the end of this class. And then also print out the session information for provenance and reproducibility. So if I then generated a PDF of this report, the, um, the uh, um, sort of information related to how this was generated, the packages that were attached, the versions, et cetera, would all be uh, included. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Yeah, OK. So, so this, is, this is what we're looking for. So um, really, I just walked through. I, I, I told you a little bit about the data set. Um, this will become um, especially important if you choose your own data set for the final class. If you choose one of the data sets um, that are in, that's included in the uh, tidy biology package, then right, your homework today is to, to look at it, to understand it, to see what variables are there, to see how many observations, things like this. So if you use one of those, which I assume most of you will, 
that was the point of including them for you is so that you would have something uh, to use, then you can assume that we all know a little bit about it. Um, if you choose one of your own data sets, then go ahead and take a little extra time to tell us about the data set, how it was generated, and so on. All right? But then you can see, like, this was some exploratory data analysis. I did some of these things. It wasn't very surprising. But then I did this, and that was interesting. And then I thought about it. You know, it's like walk through your thinking. And then one of the most important things, although brief, is to include, at the end, prioritize follow-up studies. Because one of the things that I, I, I hope I impart on you from this class, if there's one thing that you take away, is that with data science skills like these, you can come up with better hypotheses. Because if you remember the very first class, I started the class by setting the context and setting the stage and saying, there are different ways to come up with, with uh, hypotheses, and there's different approaches to take data and to turn it into knowledge. And hopefully, you can see that I did a little bit of analysis here. And from this, I come up with this observation. Now, I don't know if this is interesting or not, or if this is known. I might have to go to PubMed to see how much is known about the relationship between DNA fidelity across the human chromosomes. But if not much was known, then I would think about, well, what would I do next? Right? And this is where your specific expertise comes in. Because with our different perspective and our different training, the experiment might be, well, um, I'm in a Drosophila lab. So I would mutagenize um, the Drosophila and look and see when exposed to mutagen, um, are the X and Y chromosomes protected from some sort of genomic mutagenic stress? Or something, right? Or if you were in a um, a cell biology lab, you would say, "Well, I would do um, some um, some chip experiments. I really want to look at the you know the chromatin compaction around you know these uh, uh, these chromosomes or something like this, right?" So being able to go from I have this observation to these are the things I would do to test it is incredibly important, and those are hopefully the skills that we're teaching you in class today. All right, now, there's a couple of um, sort of uh, parting thoughts, okay? Now, what you should um, do for your final project, you can look at the final project uh, directory. It has a template. You can use that if you would like. So your final project assignment should have three uh, parts. One is going to be an uh, R Markdown document, just last name, R Markdown document with the full code. A knitted report, you can say that as an HTML or PDF, it doesn't matter, it's up to you. But I want you to knit it so that you can then look at my knitted, your knitted report compared to the code. And then also output some PNG uh, or some uh, image file type of your uh, uh, final image. Your two to three minute oral presentation, review the data, review the output file, some salient observations, and strategy to test hypotheses, just like I did for you. Now, each of you will also have open um, a, um, I'll provide a link in the class on Monday um, to feedback on your oral presentation. So each of you will provide feedback for the speaker immediately after the speaker has given their feedback. I'll compile all of those as anonymous feedback. So you'll just say, you did this great, you did this terribly, work on this, et cetera. And we'll provide that then for each of you. So each of you will have 20 forms of feedback from all of your classmates, right? I'm telling you this because these are the things that your classmates will be judging you on, so these are the things that you want to prepare. So the first is content, second is visuals, third is the mechanics of the presentation. Did I go too quickly? Did I you know, stand in front of it? Did I, you know, whatever, right? Just the mechanics of it. And the third is just the overall, like overall, how did it go? The last thing to mention, as described in the syllabus, I will ask each of you to provide your final grade for this class. Now, as your instructor and co-instructors, we, of course, will have final discretion on this. But there is an opportunity for you here to, to look at how well you did in this class. Right? Like, you know, thoughtful reflection and justification for a letter grade 
um, is going to be weighed in this, but self-critique is an important skill for scientists. You should be able to look at your time in this class and say, you know, I really didn't try that hard, or I didn't really work as hard as I would have liked, or, you know, I did my damnedest, and therefore I think I deserve, you know, a grade that represents this, right? So I'll ask each of you to fill this out for yourself and submit this also on um, Monday. And so you can look at some of the concluding thoughts. Um, actually, there's just four slides. I'll just go over them. So concluding thoughts. So first, resources. Cheat sheets make it easy to learn quickly, or easy to learn and quickly refer to some of these functions of the common packages within the tidyverse. These will be your friends this weekend. Next, Stack Overflow. If you haven't already found this, Googling some of these things, these um, you know, commands, like how do I remove a legend title in ggplot, um, will come up with, um, with these, right? And it's nice when Google reminds you, uh, you visited this page yesterday, right? Like these sorts of things. So uh, third, I'll highlight again. So Garrett and Hadley have a book that is free online. You can order a hard copy with it through Amazon or wherever uh, if you'd like. But uh, free online is R for data science. This is the, the long course in data science, not the five class fire hose uh, version that, that we gave you. And then lastly, um, Ali mentioned this, but there's this um, uh, online activity called Tidy Tuesday, which is a weekly practice to go from a data set into a visualization. So if you want to look for, I mentioned this here because if you want to look for um, different types of visualization for your project this weekend, you can just look up Tidy Tuesday. You can look at, uh, on Twitter especially, is where many people post their Tidy Tuesday submissions um, that you can then get inspired for how people look at a categorical variable compared to a continuous variable and you know, how to display that the right way and, and these things. And the Tidy Tuesday code is uh, almost universally included in that like, submission. And so um, you'll have links to GitHub repositories that provide code like how do I, uh, so for example, like you saw, I drew some arrows on my, my plot. Those were arrows that were included in code and I saw other examples of how to do that to then put that online. So this might be a resource for you this weekend. So I'll mention this on Monday, but just to acknowledge Ali and Akshay for helping with this class. Inspiration ideas, packages, and code um, for all these people and um, all of you guys. So um, if you have any questions, we're happy to stick around. But otherwise, I would encourage you, if you have uh, problems, you, know, you can't squash bugs, you are uncertain about something, reach out to us on Slack. All right? And we'll be happy to help. Otherwise, we'll see you Monday. All right. That wraps up Tidy Biology for today. Thank you for watching. And if you have any comments, go ahead, put them below. If you like us, give us a thumbs up. If you want to see more of this, go ahead, hit the subscribe, and you'll see all of the videos that we post about Tidy Biology. Thanks. See you again.